There's an entire front row up here. Look at this. I know. Oh, yeah. Gary does rhyme with scary. <laughs> All right, guys. Welcome to Duo Tech Talks. Thanks, everyone, for, for coming. Um, probably second or third most RSVPs. <laughs> and, and I will say what? Number, number one was Mudge. I wrote a bot for that. Number one was Mudge, so that's a, that's a good place to be. I don't um, see Mudge. Oh, well, number one was Mudge. Yeah. I follow Mud. Yeah, that's pretty Dude, good. You no, know, we were in the same quartet when we were kids in music camp. That's weird. Yes, I've known Mud since, <laughs> since, he, since we were 12. And I, I think Gary said he last gave his talk at DARPA. Was, yep. it, was it for Mud? Or was no, it? Mud wasn't there. Okay. That was for Mudge's boss's boss. Cool. Uh, did anyone catch the tech talk last month in San Francisco on streaming? No? There are seats up here, people. Yeah, come sit up front here. Come sit up front. Uh, I think we have a front. Martin, game. is that is that talk up? Yet? Oh, he's gonna check yeah. it out. Boo! So we had Another our front guy. We had our first snot. Yeah, come on up. We had our first. Yeah, give this guy a hand. There we go. <laughs> yes. We had our first non Ann Arbor Tech <laughs> talk out in San Francisco, and Ryan Huber from Slack gave a, a great presentation on security automation. So you can go online and check that out. Um, to start off, I wanted to open up to introductions. If you have any local event announcements, uh, job announcements, whatever else, tell us about your cats. Um, raise your hand, and Martin will throw this microphone at your face. <laughs> it's the cube. There yeah. we go. Whoa. Uh, Whoa. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Hi, I'm Nate. Uh, I work for Human Element. Uh, we're looking for web developers, so if you are one, you should talk to me. or. Stuff like that, and then learn about security. What does Human Element do? We do web development, mostly e-commerce. Cool. Yeah, man. Back that way, I think. Geeks throwing stuff around. Somebody think. Somebody <laughs> thought this was a. Is this like a sport? <laughs> All right. Uh, no other announcements. Um, cool. Uh, I'm John Oberheide, CEO of Duo. We're hiring a ton of people across the board. Um, we actually just got a, a grant from the state of Michigan. They finally gave us some money to hire more people in the state of Michigan. Uh, so we're hiring 300 people over the next three years. Um, so if, uh, if you're looking for a job, and uh, particularly in uh, engineering, product, um, information security, um, come chat with me or uh, look for other people with green-ish shirts on, or do have stickers on them, or blue, blue shirts too. There's Brendan, our, our intern. Um, yeah, look for people with shirts and just say, how do I work at Duo? And they'll point you to the right. That's right a normal place. software requirement, isn't it? Yeah, or oh, cakes. Oh yeah, make it secure. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to bring up Dennis from Vertilabs, who, uh, they hosted a great uh, medical device security conference. Um, they've solved medical device security, so there's no more, <laughs> no more issues. Congrats. Congratulations. Um, de yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Gary's going to be solving software security just generally today. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, no Dennis no. is the reason that Gary's in town, so I thought I'd hand it over to him to, to introduce him. Thanks, man. No problem. So um, it looks like there's a whole lot of people who, who will be applying for security jobs pretty soon. And uh, before you do this, there's a book that you guys have to go through. It's called Building Secure Software. The one from 2000 you're going to make them read? Wow. Okay. Among other things, because it had a lasting impression on many of us, including me, when I was going through grad school, including every, uh, on everything. Anyway, so Gary McGraw is here uh, from... He was uh, at the Archimedes conference. He spoke this morning, actually. So he's going to do a twofer yeah. within 24 hours. So thank you for doing it, for doing this. Long history in uh, in security. You guys have come across many of his writings and his wisdom, and he's going to give you a little bit more of that wisdom tonight. So, without further ado, we'll um, I'll give the microphone to uh, to Gary. And thanks for being give it back to him. I don't need it. Oh, I already <laughs> have a mic. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so the last time I gave this talk was at DARPA, but the time before that was for Navy intelligence, and I was a slight bit late, even though I had, you know, uh, 
flag pass and everything, park my car where the admirals park. But getting to that spot took an extra 25 minutes because I think they x-rayed my car and they like took mirrors and put them in weird places. And I finally got there and I was maybe three minutes late and the CO meets me out front and says, dude, we're late. So we start running in up these stairs and then the security people wanted to like check my ID again and check my laptop and he's like, the hell with that, we don't have time. So we ran past that and I, I'm like, dude, I, I've been driving for an hour so I gotta go pee. So, so I went to the restroom and I come out. Now I'm like four minutes late or five minutes late. And the, the CO and I walk into this room of a thousand people and they all go, whoop! And that was like the freakiest thing <laughs> that has ever happened to me in my life because I'm a geek, I'm not a military guy. And it was weird to see these military guys doing the military guy thing. It was like, whoa, that's some power. You know, and the CO's just like, whatever, sit down. This is... <laughs> Needless to say, what I had to say to those guys resonated with them. Um, and the reason for that is a lot of people in our field talk about cyber war. And just to put it bluntly, they don't know what the F they're talking about. Um, so I wanted to find a warfighter and talk to him about war. And this happens to be a guy who also knows about computer security. His name is Nate Fick. Um, he's now the CEO of Endgame. So at the time, he was working for the Center for New American Securities. And you might, you might know him because, let's see, what did he do? He, he wrote a book called One Bullet Away um, about the first Iraq invasion. And he was in that HBO thing. You remember Generation Kill? Did any of you guys see that? Yeah. That was him, so he was, that was Nate. So anyway, he's an amazing guy. He has a master's degree in classics from Dartmouth. He has an MBA from Harvard. He is a true geek, and he's also a warfighter. So I thought it would be good to get together with somebody who is an actual military guy to talk about cyber war without all the bullshit. And this is the result of that work. So none of this, you know, some of this thinking is mine, but if there are problems with the thinking, it's definitely Nate's fault. <laughs> and he's not here or listening. Uh, if he is, hi, Nate, never mind, all cool. Let me tell you where I'm coming from. So came from the Marines. Um, and now he's the CEO of a, of a security company. I, can, I come from a company called Sigital. We've got about 500 people. And I'm a software guy. Um, I went to grad school at Indiana, and I was totally shocked to see my friend Steve, who taught me everything I know about Unix, which was just a smidge, <laughs> back in this, you know, SunOS days when Unix was cool before System 5 fucked it all up. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I was trying to run the Unix pile in the lab somewhat, and when I would just totally screw up, I'd be like, Steve, dude, can you bail me out? And they, they would always say, if you would just relinquish root, we would do it for you. <laughs> But we were academics, and we're like, no way, dude. We got to have root for no apparent reason. <laughs> so we don't have to chamod everything 777 to make it work. So anyway, that's an interesting little aside. I didn't learn anything about security in grad school, really, except for some wars that we fought with the FTP Juarez guys. Um, but, but when I got out of grad school, I started working at this little startup. Um, called Sigital, and we had seven people at the time, and Java had just come out. Anybody know what Java is in here? Right, so, yeah, when Java came out, there were these guys that were breaking Java. Do you remember that? That was me <laughs> and Ed Felton and the guys from Princeton. And it made me wonder back in those days why those people screwed it all up, you know, when it came to security. And that's what got me started thinking about software security. I was a software guy going, if you were a software guy, and you weren't even an uber god like, say, Bill Joy or Guy Steele, who's the best languages guy alive on the planet. Well, not because his name is Guy, but because he's a person, right? <laughs> the best languages person on the planet. And they screwed it up. What chance do normals have? And the answer was nobody really knows. There were a few things. You could read Bishop and Dildo. You could read 2600. There was smashing the stack for fun and profit. But really nobody was talking about, hey, idiots, let's build the shit right. So that's what I started doing 20 years ago. And we've made like little tiny bit of progress. Some, not enough, but some. And I'm really heartened by the fact that you know, I come to town and some people say, hey, will you give a talk? And I'm like, sure. And all you guys show up. So awesome. Thank you so much. 
for being interested. And I want to approach this cyber war thing from software security. Um, at Sigital, we do commercial software security. Even though our headquarters is in Northern Virginia, just far enough away from Washington, <clears throat> like 45 or 50 miles, we don't do much work with the federal government anymore. Back in the early days, I did some DARPA research grants when I was a science boy. Um, and we transferred some of that tech out into the real world. But all of our work is commercial work. We work with huge software houses. We work with big, giant banks. Um, we work with people who have so much code, you look at the wall of code and go, oh my god, how, what are we, oh, why'd you do that? So, so that's what we do all day. And my perspective is completely colored by commercial security, what's going on in software security in the real world. So we got this warfighter dude, and we got this software security commercial guy, and we got together to do this work. And here is kind of the outline of the talk. First, we're going to talk about cyber, 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 and some cyber and maybe some potatoes, but probably cyber. And then we're going to talk about the problem of defense and offense the hell that means and why it's a really bad idea to only focus on offense. And then we're going to talk about what real defense is, which is not having a sock with a bunch of jackasses watching the internet go by in Winchester, Virginia, going, dude, some stuff happened. Press the button. Cool. Because that's not what it's about. Uh, and so what is it about? And that's, that's what I'm going to kind of focus on. We wrote this paper originally that this talk came from uh, for policymakers because we were trying to get non-geeks that, you know, some of these guys don't even believe in evolution. Really? No, really. Those people, those people are trying to understand what we're talking about. Ah. So our plan was to get those people who don't even believe in evolution <laughs> to, to like understand computer security, and we failed miserably. But we did come up with some great work, and the geeks all like it. Like when I tell it to geeks, they're all like, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Awesome talk. And you go to policy then, and they're like, well, what did Jesus say about that? And you're like, no. oh. <clears throat> yeah, sorry. I'm just going to stop talking about that now. <clears throat> So, am I allowed to say that here? It's Ann, it's Ann Arbor, right? Yeah, okay, good. I can say it in Virginia, but I gotta be running when I say it, right? So, <laughs> so here's one problem. You know, the PR people love the cyber, cyber, some cyber, and there is a big confusion about war and espionage and, you know, crime and, Denial of service and some fucking 12-year-old <laughs> with a web browser. And, and it all gets all confused and mashed up together, right? So the, re the first question is, what is cyber war? And what counts as war? And what doesn't count as war? And can we actually come up with a definition that works for the guys who served where people were shooting at them? That was war, that, you know, it was scary, and he brought back all of his guys. Nobody got, nobody got killed. Some people got wounded. But this guy, I mean, that's the coolest thing that Nate did is he went through that crap and brought back all of his guys, which is amazing. So I have all sorts of respect for this guy, and I'm glad he's on my team, <laughs> seriously. But when you talk to a real warrior about cyber war, you get past the crap. And in computer security land, we're not really quite past the crap yet, and it's important that we do that. So what is real war, and what's Shimura, and you know, why is it that the policymakers get this wrong? And here's one reason. You know, we, we have a big glob of cyber espionage. We got the Aurora stuff. We got Snowden stuff. We got bad compartmentalization. You know, this is common. And guess what, guys? Espionage, not war. Remember when they shot down Gary Powers on the U-2 plane? They didn't nuke us, because <laughs> that wasn't war. That was spying. Spying happens. We spy like crazy. In fact, we're the people who invented the world's best spy device and conned people into paying for it. 
and sticking it in their pocket. Like, dude, really? <laughs> and it's just like, well, he's here and he just bought some shit and he called this person. And it's like just yelling that in the clear. You're like, shut up, shut up. <laughs> so, you know, this is a great spying device. And we sort of have a problem where the guys that are supposed to be hacking these for espionage for us, say, the NSA dudes, who are pretty good at hacking stuff, you know? They're also supposed to secure stuff. What? <laughs> what? If you had the world's best spy tool in everybody's pocket, would you fix it so that you couldn't hack it? If you're supposed to hack it on Thursdays or not? What do you think? I mean, what's cooler? Hacking it or fixing it? Hello? Yeah, I know, I know. It's the NASCAR effect. Hacking it's always cooler. Right? So, so we are even having the people that are running this stuff, you know, at working at cross purposes from a policy perspective. And they have a hard time understand, not understanding that espionage and crime aren't really war. So that's important. And it's important that we make that distinction super clear. Um, and in order to make that distinction super clear, um, we can talk about reality and hype with a few examples. And I'll tell you the definition that we came up with, me and Nate. The, the idea was, if you blew some shit up, it's probably war. If there was a kinetic impact and stuff broke and you couldn't put it back together again, that's war. It's like drop a bomb and kill some people and break some shit. That's war, right? You know, stopping somebody with a stop sign or a denial of service attack, <laughs> that's a pain in the ass, but it's not war. And the kinetic impact was what we were looking for. So if we look at some hype things, the one that always gets trotted out after how many years has this been? God, it's, what's it, 2016 now? I keep forgetting. Nine years. Still on Capitol Hill, they're like, well, the entire company, or sorry, company, the entire country of Estonia was DDoSed by the Russians. And you're like, uh, let's see, what was Estonia's net connection looking like at the time? <laughs> oh, you know, it was like a straw. Yeah, and how many terabytes, gigabytes, peta, oh, me megabytes did that take? <laughs> Seriously, you know, and sure, it was a real problem, but it, not really. I mean, look, at Amazon, they would have been like, oh, dude, a little tiny ant is trying to attack my pinky toe. <laughs> Seriously, or, oh, we'll edge route around that puppy, or, you know, just give it to Arbor, whatever. So, <laughs> Estonia, <laughs> that's a really shitty example. That's not really war. And if you go to Congress, they're still like, they could take a whole country like us off the net. And you're like, you're dumb. <laughs> Can't talk to you. Oh, damn, you represent me. Damn, damn, damn. <laughs> right? So, yay, democracy. Uh, let's see what else. Blackout. Oh, yeah, the China hijacking the internet. Anybody ever play with BGP in here? <laughs> yeah. How's it going with BGP? <laughs> Dude, I think I'll be France. Ah, France is big. What was I thinking, right? <laughs> you could be YouTube, yeah. You could, like, move YouTube to Utah. That would be kind of fun. Like when the NSA, well, never mind. So <laughs> BGP is not secure. BGP needs to be better than it is. And if you screw up, you can like route traffic in places it's not supposed to go really fast for a while. Hey, new route, ah, you know. So, <laughs> so when China screws up for a few minutes, they are like, China's trying to take control of the internet. It's like, nope, they can't write code. <laughs> yep, that was just a BGP screw up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so is that war? And should we count that as war? Like, if they do that, should we think about nuking them? Really? Really? That's a serious question. Because that'd be pretty freaking stupid to nuke them for screwing up BGP, even if they did it on purpose. It's just BGP. Really? So if we're going to count something as war, we got to be able to say, well, if you attack us and it's warlike and you break our shit, like you take our power grid down, we will nuke you. Any questions? Seriously. There's nothing wrong with that. We are a nuclear power. I am a wild liberal. But you know what? Sometimes a deterrent is a good thing. And 
Now, I'm kind of glad that we have a nuclear capability in this country, uh, and we can use that to back up threats against us, right? It's not very peaceful, but it's just real politic. So we have to kind of figure out how this approach to the world fits in this, you know, and when the, when the media is saying cyber war every time a little thing happens, we should worry. We should go, no, that's not war. That's not worth sending anybody to die over. Like, nobody should have to die for that. Um, and we need to think about that. So the disentanglement is what we tried to do. Now, there are some examples of cyber war, like uh, the CIA caused the Soviet pipeline to blow up, which you could see from space in 1982. And the way that worked was the Soviets were stealing some Canadian stuff for pipelines. And we knew they were stealing Canadian stuff. So we changed the Canadian stuff they were stealing. And they stole it anyway. And then they installed it. And it was wrong. And so they turned it on. And it went boom. Like, didn't kill anybody. But boy, did it screw up that pipeline. Right? So that was one. Or, you know, the Syrians who uh, are having <laughs> Some problems lately, we're trying to build a nuclear reactor. Can you imagine if ISIS had a freaking nuclear reactor? I mean, really, good God. So the Syrians had the North Koreans come in and they were building a nuclear reactor for Assad in 2007, and the Israelis were like, nope. So they took down the air defenses of Syria, flew in with a few F-16s and wiped that off the face of the earth. And the Syrians were like, hey, nothing happened. <laughs> really? Were you building a nuclear reactor? No. Well, what happened there? Nothing. <laughs> really? There wasn't anything there. It was just glass. I mean, sand. Something. <laughs> now, should we go around blowing up people's nuclear reactors? Yes. That's totally fine. Yep, too bad. Dude, I don't want the Syrians, I don't want the Iranians to have a nuclear reactor either. But they have a bunch, you know? So we, we need to think about nuclear non-proliferation in the right way. I just, by the way, did, if you want to know my political views on this, did a podcast with Marty Hellman, who won the Turing Award and invented public key cryptography. Marty has been working on non-proliferation in a very serious way for about 25 years. Listen to the podcast. Um, and Here's some ideas that he has about how we can really work on this problem. So all the glibness aside, we've got to figure out when something is real and when it's not. I put a thing that, on here that's not so real, but it's real enough that the Under Secretary of Defense wrote about it in you know, Foreign Affairs and said, you know, in Iraq they did the parking lot USB drop and, on us and it worked. <laughs> No, really, they, it's just like so dumb. The guy's like, cool, free USB drive. Let me stick that into the nipper net, you know, or the super net, whatever it's called, the, the one you're not supposed to stick it into. All right, so, so, I, so I told you about the, I told you about the cross purposes problem, but I want to, I want to talk about that a little bit more. At the end of World War II, policymakers that were really smart knew that we had invented a thing that was super dangerous. And one of the things we figured out in this democracy was it's pretty stupid to give, you know, a thousand people the capability to build the thing that could kill the whole species and also deploy it. So we're going to separate the builder dudes and we're going to put them in the Department of Energy from the dropper on the other people dudes and we're going to call that the Department of Defense and they're not going to work together because we're not going to consolidate power in one place. Separation of concerns is a really good idea in policy around nuclear weapons. Now, what do we do in cyber cyberland? We go, oh, the NSA, those guys know something about some computers and stuff. They got some computers. And they know how to hack things. They do some hacking stuff. So surely they should also do the defense stuff, which is like, what? And I told you before with the example, if you had something that was working as a spy device in everybody's pocket, why in the hell would you secure it? Because you got two jobs, hacking everybody's stuff and also making the stuff secure? Dude, that's dumb. We cannot have people like General Hayden, who's retired, or what's the guy, Keith Alexander, who's also retired. Those guys are just making a lot of money now, aren't they? Mm. Uh, or the dude who, I don't know, th those guys, they shouldn't be in charge of defense. 
Now, I don't know who should be. That's not my problem. But I do know that people that were smarter than we are apparently figured that out during the nuclear time um, and got that thing set up right. So we need to think about that cross-purposes problem um, in the cyber domain. Let's talk about offense and defense a little bit. Some people think that defense is about, you know, cardboard shield stuff like, you know, the first paradigm I learned about in computer security in like 1996 when I started reading books about computer security and thinking about it for this DARPA grant that we had was let's protect the broken stuff from the bad people by putting a thing. What's the thing called? Yeah, firewall. And you know what? It's not so bad, but there's a really simple question you should ask when confronted with broken stuff, bad people thing. What's that question? Why is the stuff broken? And that's what I did in like, you know, 1998. Uh, excuse me, but why is the stuff broken? Shut up, we're building firewalls. Now, now we're trying to figure out that the perimeter no longer exists, that we've been building highly distributed systems on purpose, that the cloud is a real thing, that there's a server somewhere over there that does some stuff that you didn't even know that's part of your system, and there's no edge anymore. So we can't draw a boundary around stuff. We can't put a thing in front of the broken stuff anymore because it's all connected to everything. That is a problem. So real defense has to be about building systems that do not suck. Seriously. Software that does not suck, designs that do not suck, and things that a 12-year-old with a web browser can't just take down. You know, Script Kitty takes down a server? Still? Really? Come on. So that's what, to me, real defense is. Now, offense is way sexier. Zero days, so cool. I wrote an exploit, wow, so cool. Like I can run this code. But you know what the best attack tool in the whole planet is right now? Anybody know? Chrome. <laughs> it's Chrome, because you just Google up the thing and you go, oh, there's an attack tool. Let me aim that at that IP pile and see what happens. And that still works, which is kind of silly. Right, so defense is not operations. It's not sitting in the sock watching the packets. And when we put humans in the loop to do that, we're asking for trouble because the net doesn't operate at human time. It's a little bit faster. And you know, it's not like the graphics get rendered like war games and you go, oh, dude, we have 19 minutes before we all die. It's more like, oh, we're dead. Oh. You know, but we saw it happen. <laughs> So these people in the operational centers, they give great demo. I tell you, man, you go to some of these classified socks and they're like, it's really impressive. There's glass all over the place and there's people clicking and moving shit and there's browsers and there's like always 19 clocks. And you're like, why do you guys still use analog clocks? <laughs> oh, for the, yeah, for the press shot, right. Like, remember this at CERT, they, put, they were like, we need some clocks, guys. It'll look better if there's like clocks. And I'm really not impressed that it do. There's like one freaking clock. I mean, is this like a one time zone company, guys? Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, good. That's, that's a relief. I went back there, but I was just too busy getting a beer to, 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 to really look. Right? So, <laughs> so to me, defense means security engineering. Um, and so I would like to figure out how to make security engineering work. Let's talk about the offense problem a little bit. Grandma said that people who live in glass houses should not throw rocks. And what we would like to do is say, well, now, some people claim, corporations should be allowed to attack back. That is the dumbest goddamn idea I've ever heard. Like, really? We're going to let... Oracle attack people? <laughs> Larry Ellison is going to get to decide? That's crazy. That's like giving Hitler stuff. Like, don't, don't do that. Okay, he's, he's nicer. He's not really like Hitler, but he is sort of, he's a megalomaniac. So, you know, so, 
those are like, no, there shouldn't be a bunch of dudes who try to make money for stockholders deciding whether to carry out a cyber attack. That's insane. That's nuts, right? So active defense, look into it. It's a really bad idea. Don't do it, you know? Um, should we take action when we have an attack as a country? Yes, absolutely. And we should have very clear engagement policies and procedures, and there should be some adults who decide you know, what an attack is. But if we automate it, we have trouble. You know why? Who the hell is that on the internet? <laughs> I don't, have we solved the attribution problem? Anyone? Anyone? No? Does anybody believe we've solved the attribution problem in here? Come on, one guy. No guys? No, nobody? All right. Well, when you say that to military people, they're like, oh, yeah, we got that solved. That was definitely North Korea. And you're like, oh, really? I mean, Iran. No, it was the Chinese. You know. Well, what did Mandiant say? <laughs> so, <laughs> 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 it's the reality, guys. And uh, guess what? Here's a good tactic. If you are somebody's enemy and they have another enemy, then you're going to attack them. You want them to attack your other enemy. You pretend like you're them when you attack those guys and they attack the wrong guy and you win. Everybody get that? It's yeah. not that hard. It's just one level of indirection. And if you don't remember, just go back to The Hobbit. Mm. So I came up with this fantastic example based on The Hobbit. And I wrote this careful paper. I went back and reread the section of The Hobbit, made sure everything worked right, and wrote this whole thing. And then that stupid movie came out, and they got it wrong. And I was like, oh, I just spent 20 hours doing this so that dumb people could watch the movie. And I could use that as an example. <laughs> but the movie's wrong. <laughs> anyway, what really happens in The Real Hobbit and not the movie <laughs> is, you know, Bilbo is charged with going to steal some stuff and he gets put in a bag and then all the dwarves go and they get put in bags and then the, the trolls are all talking about how they're going to cook these little tiny things and whether they taste good with cream sauce and whatever. And, you know, the trolls are brothers, so they're having an argument about this and then Gandalf gets involved and starts throwing his voice and pretending to be one of the trolls. And the trolls end up getting in a big old knockdown drag-out fight till the sun comes up and they turn into rocks. That is misattribution. <laughs> cool on Gandalf. So it would really suck if, say, you know, we had like a hair trigger response doohickey set up, the ion cannon beam thingy from James Bond that goes ee when you turn it on, and we have that like aim somewhere, and we just say, well, that was definitely the North Koreans. Ee! And it was like, oh, shit, it was the Russians. Ooh! You know, so... How do you do attribution? Well, you have people on the ground, you do human intelligence, and when you do it, you often get those people killed, you know, if you start a war based on their intelligence. Um, and we do that. We've got spies. We're really good. We're the best. We have the best spies. Yeah, we got the best military. <laughs> we really do in the United States. If you're not from the United States, sorry, dudes. Ours is better, right? And that's just, that's just the way it goes. That, and, and, that's fine with me. I don't have a problem with that. But we have to realize that the attribution problem is not solved because some guy would like it to be solved. Uh, and that's super important. I, I still have this argument with the real military guys in Cyber Command. They just don't. They don't believe it. They believe Mandiant. Right. Now let's talk about cyber attacks. Everybody knows Stuxnet. Remember how Stuxnet was like, wow, that was like so hard. It took like 100 million man hours and at least cost us like 150 million dollars. And dude, no. So Stuxnet, the attack part of it was DLL interpositioning from 1997. Really, you guys remember DLL interpositioning stuff? That's all Stuxnet really did. Now, the fancy pants parts around the outside of Stuxnet that took some time and some money were the part that made Stuxnet not be super obvious. Like, hey, what's that DLL doing there is a bad question. We don't want them asking that. And so, you know, putting the stuff around the weapon and the delivery thing and figuring out how to get it into these nuclear plants and all that stuff, that was really the sophisticated part. But the payload part, 
was not. What's the problem with that, you guys? Anybody see the problem with that? What was the payload part? It was easy or hard? Easy, really easy. Do you think that that payload part would work, say, against our stuff? Yes, because it's easy, <laughs> you know. And does it still work? Yes, you know. Now that was granted some old Siemens shit, you know. I was actually in the room with the guy from Siemens who was in charge of software security. His name is Peter, I'm not gonna tell you his last name. When Langner in a group of 30 people said, and I think this is step seven code, because <laughs> I put Wireshark and I watched the thing do these calls and that looks like step seven and Peter went, oh shit, and he left the room. <laughs> and the story broke in like two hours on the Washington Post because they were in the room too. Right, so yeah, yeah, poor guy, his job like totally changed, right? So, but, but the, the point is this, guys, the attack itself, the payload itself was easy. It wasn't hard. The idea from Stuxnet was not really to cause centrifuges to break. You know what it was? It was to cause engineers to despair. And these people were already under attack. If you're a nuclear engineer working in the Iranian regime, your life fucking sucks. They want you to get that done last week, and they're going to kill your family if you don't. And by the way, the Israelis just blew up your friends in their car with sticky bombs, and you better get that done. And, you know, so you're making the code, and you're just trying to twirl around uranium hexafluoride, and guess what? It doesn't work, and you're getting the wrong kind of shit out, and your life sucks. That's what it was for, right? We were trying to set the Iranians back three or four years, and guess what? We did. <laughs> We did, and that's totally fine, that's, that's fine. But it's not, you know, is that whatever. So let's be clear about DLL interpositioning. I wrote this book called Exploiting Online Games, which was just fun. You know, I wrote a book called Exploiting Software, which was really cool, and I wrote all these books about how to build stuff right, like software security, and then Hoglin came to me and he's like, dude, I've been doing this game stuff and it's so cool, there's like these pretend worlds and there's money. <laughs> and you can like hack it and get real money. I'm like, yeah, okay. I don't think I can write about that because I'm supposed to be like, you know, CTO guy talking to the bank dudes and they're gonna be like, you wrote a book about games? And he goes, no, 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 dude, I know, I know. Look at this code. And I was like, holy shit, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Really, you can make money? And we started burning identities and, you know, writing code, which, may or may not be available, and you know, we had boxes that got toasted. It was really fun. But back in the old days, there was this attack that looked like this. You have a thread in your box, and you put a patch on here, and you stick a DLL over there, and you just jump over there, and you do whatever the hell you want for a while, and then you return. That was DLL inter interpositioning, right? Guess what? That stopped working in 2004 or five. It doesn't work. Like you can't do that on Warcraft. <laughs> and around 2005, it stopped working. But guess what it does work on? Siemens PLC control systems. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Now, you can hack games, but if you're gonna hack games, you gotta do more something like this because you know you got like multiple processors and a hypervisor or super Supervisor, and you can throw interrupt three and make the Intel chip just go huh, and you know the other chip can keep running and you can do some stuff over here and you can build an exploit based on the fact that that's a target and you know how its memory is laid out and you just shove it in the thing and then you go all right never mind turn back on it goes who and it just runs whatever you just did to it and you know what it doesn't know because there's no Rip Van Winkleometer thing really it doesn't go Dude, I was just off for three real seconds. Oh, shit. How many billion instructions can run in three seconds? More than two. <laughs> this still works against World of Warcraft stuff, which is really cool. This is not what we had to do to knock over the Iranian stuff, you know? So if we open up the box to we're just going to be breaking your stuff now and we all decide we're going to break each other's stuff, oh, shit, that's not good. That's bad. So the point is this. 
attacks aren't that complicated. So let's just like not use them. <laughs> and you know what? There's just a few vulnerabilities. <laughs> like here's a little graph that Yvonne Arche from Core put together, just counting up the new vulns and the cumulative sum because some of these don't actually ever get fixed. And you know what? That's a big sum and that stops in 2011. <laughs> so are there things to attack? Yep. And then there's this. Remember, what we were doing with Stuxnet was trying to disrupt the Iranian thing without having them find out. So we were trying to be sneaky bastards about it. And this is easy. Like if you're just trying to make the things working or shake itself to death, which by the way, we didn't try to do. Shaking those things to death is dumb when they have like 2,000 of them in the closet. Like, shaking them to death one at a time, that's dumb. <laughs> and they'll figure it out. So that's not what we were talking about. But guess who can do that? Like anybody. Given, oh, yeah. If you were given, is the battery dying? That's the, no, the wireless. All right. If you were given, you know, uh, something to attack and not really that powerful of a tool, you could just, you know, non-deterministically take it down pretty easily. We could do that. You know, when, the, when Mudge sat in Congress and said, we could take the net down in 12 minutes, well, <laughs> that's true. <clears throat> it would be kind of dumb. You know, your job as a cyber guy would be over. <laughs> so it'd be a little self-defeating, but that's not the point. And then there's controlling things the way you want. This is just tripping them up. Then there's making them do what you want. And then there's making them do what you want without anybody figuring out that you just made them do what you want. That's the part that's atypical, and it takes a lot more capability. So let's talk about money. How many countries can have a nuclear sub-fleet? No, that's wrong. Two, three. It's three. Three. I mean, one of them's kind of shitty, but, you know, the Russians have a pretty good one again. You know, they've been building drones just like us. So, so, so the submarine fleet thing is real. That costs a lot of money. It's like, no, 90 billion-ish. <laughs> How about stealth fighter jets? How many countries get those? <laughs> a bunch. Two, maybe. Two or three. I mean, those are big piles of money. But then we just move down and we say, well, you know, how, what if we have to refight World War II? This used to be part of my talk that seemed implausible. But it isn't anymore, because the Russians are crazy. Right? So, you know, it's, seriously, they're, we're moving tanks around, and we really are. We just gave a bunch to Latvia or something. It's like, what? Tanks? Really? OK. That's cheap, though, 10 billion bucks. There's a lot of countries that can do that. But you know, how about a military target-grade cyber weapon system that takes out weapon systems, like not stupid ones like the F-35 that can barely fly <laughs> and don't work when it rains, <laughs> but, but the real ones, right? So, but, but the real ones, you know, real weapon systems that we use, what does that cost? Well, that's about a billion dollars. How many countries have a billion dollar budget? What? Guess. How many countries are there anyway? I'm not really sure. 200 ish? Yeah, like, it seems like 170. You know, depends on whether you count ISIS and all their little chunks. Right? So, <laughs> 70 countries have a billion dollar defense budget. 70. Not five, not two, 70. Now, if you wanted to just go against soft civilian targets like power grids and stuff, that's like 100 million bucks. But that's, you know, going after some stuff. But what if you just wanted to screw things up once because you were just a bad terrorist person? Five million bucks. Damn, even religious groups can do that. Like, seriously, there's churches that have budgets bigger than that. Damn. Did you watch Planet of the Earth? Remember, apes, remember that? End scene of that? Right, so singular cyber attack, pretty low threshold, not so good. Here's where we sort of draw the line-ish thing around here. You know what, guys? If we're going to do this right, we're going to have to spend some money, and we're going to have to spend it on making our targets harder to attack. 
I think that the real way to stop nuclear, sorry, cyber warfare is to build things that are harder to attack and more expensive. And I also think that currently on the planet, we have the biggest gross domestic product. So why the hell aren't we doing that now? Because I thought we were smart. Uh, and it's time for the grown-ups to begin to figure that out, or those people that don't believe in evolution. Right now, there's another reason that people like to focus on the offense stuff, and that's because offense is cool. Like, you know, it's the NASCAR effect. I'm from the South. They watch people drive around cars in circles. Like, really? And the reason, they pay money for that. And the reason you do that, I've paid money for that. And the reason you do that is because occasionally some dude's going to have a crash and he'll die, and then you can, like, stick his number on your truck and have a saint and all that stuff. <laughs> it's true. Just Dale Jr., man, he's like a saint. There's like number three on all sorts of trucks where I live, really. So, you know, we got NASCAR, and we got the Volvo Car Safety Channel. <laughs> Which one are you going to put in your cable pile? <laughs> Not the Volvo. Yeah, the Volvo. They don't even exist anymore, do they? So, so... <laughs> Well, this is a problem because, you know, if we're really wanting people to engineer stuff, but the sexy part of security is breaking stuff, and we never teach them about the engineering stuff by hooking them with the breaking stuff and then accidentally teaching them something good, we're not going to get anywhere. Because this is not about breaking things and exploits and hacker boys and pretend nonsense. we got to stop that nonsense, and we got to start building stuff right. So what does that mean? Well, I already told you it doesn't mean putting an edge around stuff. This was a fantastic defense in 1350. <laughs> it was. In 1350, the height of military technology was you put metal on your body and also on your horse, and you got a stick, a big long one, and you donk the other dude who was covered with metal off of his metal-covered horse faster than he could donk you off of your metal-covered horse with your metal-covered body by running into them. 1350 was a long time ago. And when you rode like, I don't know, eight or so miles to the enemy, because you couldn't really ride that far with your horse covered with metal, <laughs> and you got to the neighbor's castle and you're like, oh shit, water. <laughs> because you were covered with metal and you couldn't swim anyway, but it's really hard to swim covered with metal, believe me. <laughs> As a scuba diver, I wouldn't recommend that you cover yourself with metal first. <laughs> Maybe stick some in your pocket, but then drop it if you need to. You know that part about you release the belts, right? So anyway, this was a great idea in 1350. Now what do we do to that defense today? We paint it from space with a laser, or we just put in its GPS coordinates. I'm not really recommended. Lasers are better. And we just, you know, send in a drone, and we do some hellfire, and boom, things gone. Bad defense. Perimeter defense is fine if you have what? A perimeter! <laughs> yeah, which we don't have anymore. So time to stop. You know, do we need firewalls? Yes, we do. Should we have ARP cache poisoning again? No, because a firewall can stop that. You know, yay! But guess what? If we had the perfect firewall, it'd just keep all the packets out. And how much would you get done? A lot, actually, because you wouldn't have net. So, <laughs> yeah, that's a bad way to put that. <laughs> you know, but we're intentionally opening up our systems and we're building these distributed systems on purpose. That's what we do, and we have to do something better than perimeter defense. Here's another one. You know, <laughs> this is a real gate, <laughs> a security gate. You're just like, dude, your gate is not working. Yeah. <laughs> Or Bruce Nyer said it best, I, you know, he said, it's like sticking one post in the ground and calling that a, you know, a, a fence and hoping that the, the bad guys run directly into that post. You know? It's the bad guy stopper post thing, <laughs> which is what we do at my house, actually. So what does it mean to do proactive defense? By the way, you can overdo it. <laughs> Can you spend too much on software security? Hell yeah. And if you'd like to overspend with Sigital, just let me know. <laughs> I can help you with that. I can make your bike look like that. 
there's the right amount. But we, in fact, know how to do security engineering, and we know how to do software security. We were just talking about that with the medical device guys who finally figured out, damn, it is software, isn't it? <laughs> Like last year. No, really. They're just like, I thought it was Windows. So, you know, and, and we have to, oops, sorry about the bug. But we have, to, we have to build security in. So how do we do that? Well, you know, some people know. This is from the book. There's the touch points. You get the developers to do some stuff like some code review and some architecture analysis and maybe some pen testing. And guess what? You don't start with pen testing. Why not? because that's late in the life cycle, and when they break it, you gotta fix it, and is it expensive or cheap to fix it late in the life cycle? You guys. Oh, so bad, yeah, never mind. That's not gonna come through the streaming, yeah, yeah. Could you like hold the ball? No, no. Sorry, streaming people, they're lame over here. I know you said expensive really loud and you're a streaming place, so that's good. Right, so, Penetration testing is not how to do software security. And everybody starts with that, because it's kind of cool. And it's true that when you do a pen test, you can disavow somebody of the false belief that their system was perfect and squeaky clean, and their code is not like that Linux code that they showed you in training from 1993. Who showed you that code? What the hell? You know, you want real training? Use your own code. It sucks, too. <laughs> really. Um, and, you know, I was talking with Alan from Arbor about the hamster wheel of pain where you identify problems and security is fixing the problems using static analysis or whatever, but they got to do the fix. And by the time they get the fixes done, the dev guys who didn't learn anything made five more. And then you just speed that up as fast as possible. That is dumb. <laughs> I get a nickel every time you do the dumb thing, so keep doing it. But, you know, it's better to break out of that loop. So we know how to do these things. And, we even have this study called the BSTEM, which if you're really interested in this stuff, go read it. It's published under the Creative Commons. We have 100 some firms that we've measured. We know what works in software security. So the excuse, oh, yeah, no, we're not sure what to do. You know what? That's wrong. We do so know what to do. We just got to do it. So technically, we got that handled. There's some people who build some code, who do some stuff. Probably, if you use code today, you use code touched by the BSIM. That's all I'm going to say about that. Check it out yourself. I will just show you, that was the animated section of the talk. Shall we go back and review? There was a shiny thing with some blue. There was a shiny thing with no blue. There was like a Starship Enterprise. <laughs> there was some like marketing shit in several colors. OK. <laughs> now here's. <laughs> That's the best part of the talk, I thought. So, so here's what happened with BSIM. We started with nine firms eight years ago. Now we have 78. We've actually measured 102, but some of the data is so old, we just threw it out because science, right? And we're talking about the work of 287,006. I love the N6. Developers. <laughs> I love the six. And we're talking about 3,000 full-time people, you know, 1,000 of them in software security groups and 2,000 other dudes that are not in software security groups but still do software security stuff, trying to control the work of 300,000 guys. Does that sound fair? It's not really fair, but it works. Yep. And we have people from financial services like every big bank on planet Earth. All of them. All of them. Guess who gives a shit about this? The guys who just figured out that bits are money. Damn. They're all over Bitcoin, by the way. It's going to be very interesting times. Coming right up. Right? ISVs. They build software. They already know it sucks. Right? Duo. <coughs> 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 Race condition. <coughs> right? So consumer electronics, that's coming up. The healthcare guys are way behind. We know to do. That's just the point of that. We've collected lots of real data. Now, I told you in the beginning of this talk that the whole idea was to get policymakers to understand this, which we failed at miserably. I'm happy to report that another guy who helped me work on this work named Richard Danzig, who used to run the Navy in the Clinton administration as a civilian, who's a brilliant guy and an intellectual, has been working on this problem, and he's making more traction with the high-end policy guys. Policy people are not dumb, you guys. They're not really idiots. They're just trying to move a whole government. <laughs> and you know how hard it is to like convince three of your friends to go to the same place for dinner? 
just, you know, do the math. <laughs> really. And no advertising. Just do the math, you know. So how about this? You know, that's not so good. We need to do some defense. If we outspend the other guys on defense, which we need to do anyway, it can be a differentiator and it can stop people from attacking us because our stuff's harder to attack than their stuff is. Do we have to share the stuff? No, we don't really. Have we been sharing the stuff? Sure, but we're like, here, stick this spy tool in your pocket <laughs> behind the firewall. Awesome. The great firewall of what? Facebook? So, right. So, you know, this, this, actually, this actually does work. And since we in the United States have the biggest GDP, we could actually do this. And you know what? We need to spend some money on our infrastructure. Two generations ago, they used to do that. Like they built these things called roads and stuff. I noticed that around here they haven't been working on them much <laughs> lately. Seriously, I'm driving my rental car. I'm like, I'm glad this is a Hertz. <laughs> Damn, was that the road or the side? Oh, it's still the road, right? So, yeah, and bridges that like fall into rivers. Damn. And you know what, guys? Our software is in worse shape than that because we didn't even build it properly in the first place. So it's time to spend some of that money stopping building planes that melt in the rain and instead working on building cyber stuff that actually works. Seriously, it really is time to do that. Now, I'm not sure what that means because I'm not a politician and I don't want to be one. I don't even really like voting for them or giving them money, but I have to. So I do, right? But, but that's just the way democracy works, I guess. Anyway, I think this. We can outspend our adversaries, so let's do it. <laughs> and in a good way, not building weapons, building better shit. We can be like, our shit is so good, don't even try. Wouldn't that be awesome? That's just good. So some other stuff. Build stuff right. What the heck is a public-private partnership? What that is is Cisco just sold more stuff to the government. That's what that is, right? That's not what we mean. <laughs> You know, so we got to reorient that. We got to get people to understand in our field that it's not really the plumbing that's the problem, it's the users. And the users are the reason for the plumbing. So we need the users to get it. And we need to make the users' life easier by building stuff that users can use and not focus on the network and the stuff that's connecting the users' stuff they're using together. And this is the toughie. I don't really know what this means. I mean, DHS can't even run the TSA. Ah, I got to fly tomorrow, dude. I'm just like, oh, shit. I hope they have TSA pre. Like, should I go there now and get in line? Because I really would like to get home. And if, the, if I get there and there's like this line out the door, I'm just going to rent a car. Just take my Hertz. Like, dude, you'll find it at Dulles Airport, right? <laughs> so we got to fix the broken stuff. That's what my belief is when it comes to cyber war. If we want to avoid it, which we can do, we should build shit that doesn't suck. <laughs> Just to cuss one more time, you're going to get, there's going to be people going, I can't believe that guy said curse words. I know who you are. I saw you. <laughs> right? So places to learn more stuff. Uh, podcast, cool podcast. Really, the nuclear proliferation conversation with Marty Hellman was very cool. He's a great guy. So listen to that. Silver Bullet has about 30,000 listeners a month now, had you know, a million and a half, almost two million downloads by this point. Um, there's this book. The cool thing is that the Duo guys said they would buy a copy of this book for each of you. So just ask them to give, deliver <laughs> your book to you next week. I said that one time, and this guy said, sure, I'll do it. And he took a book, and he like ripped it up and handed little pieces to everybody. <laughs> Here's the book I said I would buy. It was so awesome. That was like, oh, counterattack. You're <laughs> cool. <laughs> There's me. Um, and, you know, thanks for your attention. I hope you got something out of it. Thanks for the talk, Gary. Um, 
so I'm Dennis again from Berta Labs, and uh, we're going to start with the Q&A section. Um, so anybody with questions, um, go right ahead, and we'll toss you the green cube. Don't be shy. It's not that hard of a green cube. <laughs> Anything about security? Seriously, scuba just somebody scuba diving. Here, we got a guy up here. Way up here. OK. Which one's going first? You tell. Fine, over here. It comes up here a second, though. Gary, yes. we're, I'm from Verta Labs. I have to ask, what is your favorite cocktail drink? <laughs> I do believe you were there the other day when I was describing a drink called the Liberal, which is my favorite drink. Really? It's like a Manhattan. It's got three quarters of an ounce of cast strength bourbon, three quarters of an ounce of cheap red vermouth like martini is great, and a quarter of an ounce of this amazing elixir called Amer Pecan, which comes from France, and nobody imports it, so you got like go to France and get it, which wasn't so bad, because I was in France last week getting some Americon, and that was awesome. That was two weeks ago. You know, so that. Yes, please check out Gary's blog, No Plastic Shower. Oh, I, oh you're not supposed to out that. Oh, dude. <laughs> Who's next? Yeah, that's my secret alter identity. Over in the front? Yep. Up here. Right. Way up here. Stand up, stand up. It's kind of fun. I like this. <laughs> it's nice. I like this. Sportsing for geeks. Exactly. Yeah. So um, you were talking about policy, and one of the big items in the news around policy has obviously been the Wassenaar arrangement. Yeah. And um, I've got some thoughts on it. I mean, I feel like it's the wrong idea for us to be criminalizing, demonizing people who are on the offensive side. Yeah, me too. I wanted to hear you know, what other thoughts you might have around what's been going on, what the discussion in Washington has been around that. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I'll just tell you a little kind of side story. I wrote this book called Exploiting Software. And in the book, we really took Microsoft down hard. And there was like a two-byte hack for NT. Like, it was bad. And we thought we were going to get in big trouble. So we had like you know, people write stuff like, this is really important, and you shouldn't shoot the messenger on the front for the blurbs. And we're still like, OK, they're going to kill us. And you know what? Nothing happened. <laughs> so what we found out is that people like it when you talk about exploits. And you need to do that. If you don't want to know how to defend something, you need to know how exploits work. That's one story. Story two, when I was working in smart card land back in the mid-90s when we invented EMV and we were doing the security stuff, which I personally worked on, and only how many years later it shows up and it has great security from 1997? <laughs> really? <laughs> 1997? You know, we were trying to convince the French that they should talk about attacks. They wanted to use a different set of criteria um, based loosely on the federal criteria, which was right before the common criteria, um, which is just mostly, as if I can tell, just like a whole bunch of paper that you fill out. And you, you have you know, Ernst and Young do it, and they just fill out a lot of paper. So the French thought that talking about attacks was too difficult. But we knew all these attacks that had been working against real smart cards, and we were breaking them every day in the lab. And we were like, you must write this down and say, don't be susceptible to this attack or things like it. And if you don't know that, how the hell are you supposed to build a chip that's not susceptible to those attacks? And that was a battle. The French were like digging in their heels, and eventually they just lost because we overwhelmed them, <laughs> right? But it was, not, it, was hard. it was a battle. So my view, my personal view, is we should talk about attacks, and we should talk about these things. Um, on the other hand, if you militarize an exploit, and it's militarized, should that be something that we just like let everybody have? Well, maybe it should be. I don't know. That's debatable. Um, I don't like Wassner. I think it's a little overreach. Um, but I also think it's not really going to happen. I mean, n nobody, they don't, nobody knows what anything is. And this is a problem in cyber war. It's a problem in our, our discipline where we can't even talk to each other because we use the same words. But like risk means one thing to you and something else to him, and exploit means something, and vulnerability, what the hell does that mean, and what's the difference between a bug and a vulnerability, and ah, oh, and the marketing people make up new shit all the time. So imagine what happens when we go and we negotiate with the Russians, which we do, about cyber stuff. I was talking to Howard Schmidt about this, um, who is not doing well, by the way. So if you know Howard, send him a note. Um, and Howard was talking to the Russians. And you know what they did when, when, when we said you should, you should put your hacker people in jail? They were like, oh, yeah, we're going to totally do that. Then they went and arrested a whole bunch of political dissidents. 
and put him in jail. And they were like, we did it. And we were like, oh, that's not what we meant. Uh, oh, we just gave him an excuse. For, yeah, he was, yeah, he was, I think he was just blogging. That's not really hacking. So you got to be careful what you ask for um, internationally. And that really happens. I mean, try, don't be a dissident in Russia anymore. Because if you're in the press, you'll just be dead, really. So it's tricky. Uh, and, and I'm not sure what to do about these things. Now, I will tell you this. So my own work in that direction has been working directly with Richard Danzig, this guy, <laughs> on stuff he's doing for the president directly, and trying to teach him how our field really works, and getting him to talk to good people like, I don't know, Ross Anderson, and just really, Paul Kotcher, really damn good people. Um, and, and trying to teach him how to think about this. He's the guy who negotiated the SALT II Treaty. So he knows what that means. And you know what he worries about at night is our mutually assured destruction thing that we had going for nuclear disarmament. It doesn't work so well when the computers fuck up and you hit launch and nothing happens. That's bad. That's like, well, mutually, I'm not so sure. Like, uh-oh. The button doesn't work. That's not a deterrent anymore. So we're talking about that at that level. Uh, and I think that hopefully those policy guys can make some progress. Oh, over here. What do you think about the proposed bans on end-to-end -end encryption? Is that overreach or proactive defense? Uh, on what? Uh, pro uh, bans on like end-to-end -end encryption or strong encryption that are being. Oh, you mean backdooring? What do I think? Yeah, back backdooring is bad. End to end, that's what you said. I'm sorry, I was trying to, I was thinking that was an acronym of some sort. <laughs> Too close to Washington. Um, yeah, the FBI is full of shit. <laughs> yeah, they are, they're just full of shit. And I was sitting in a room with guys from the FBI, guys from the NSA, guys from the CIA. There were like 20 of us. We were having a real conversation about policy because this happens sometimes. You're just in the room with the people that actually do this stuff. Um, before the terrorist attack in San Bernardino, and they said, yeah, well, we're just gonna wait till something like that happens, like some terrorist thing, and then we're gonna go after you, and we're gonna win. And we were like, you guys are assholes. <laughs> and you know what? They're assholes. So they need to lose, right? Yep, tell everybody you know. Whoa. <laughs> now that's more like Geek Sportsing. Yes. Woo. Ten points. He gets a special sticker for that. I only have three left. Here, dude. <laughs> sticker of shame. All right. Okay. What, what, what I was going to say is, um, do you think we're not pushing defense because if everyone's vulnerable, then we could use other things as deterrents and simply you know, make this like a chemical weapon and say, you know, no one should use cyber. If, if you use cyber, we'll come back at you with something else. Uh, we've talked about that. I don't think so, but maybe. You know, when you talk to these policy guys that are all lawyers, they have this kind of convoluted logic that's sort of like that. And, you, and they, then they're really convincing, and you go, oh, yeah, maybe you're on crack. Wait, I don't know. I just almost got sucked into that. So, so you know, it's hard to tell what those people think. Um, I'm, I don't think they're that clever. I think they just don't understand it. I mean, remember, in the DRM wars, which are probably going to come right back around for copyright stuff, Hollywood was like, well, computers are just like really fancy VCRs. That's what they said. And Congress is like, well, VCRs are bad. Porn and stuff, that's bad. And copying, that's bad. We've got to stop that. Yeah. And the internet's like a really big VCR with tubes. <laughs> that's more like the conversation they had. <laughs> yeah. Can you, yeah. If you go to, so I live, you know, 60 miles from the White House, and my friends who, they're patriots. They care about this as much as we do, and they actually have enough gumption or idiocy to do this every day. 
And I go in and I do it for like three hours and I'm just like, ah, I got to go back to corporate land where shit gets done. Oh, I'll be back in approximately three years. <laughs> Seriously. But there's some people who like do this on our behalf, you know, as fellow geeks, like Ed Felton, for example, or the people at the FTC who are doing a great job in software security every day. And I respect those people even though I think they're crazy, <laughs> right? I would rather just go tell JPMC what to do. Hey, take 40 million and do that. And they're like, okay. And then they do it. The government's like, well, let's have a meeting about a meeting. And then after that, we'll have a meeting. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, I, be, I was trying to talk to some of the defense contractors about the, the uh, BSIM stuff, because we've got all sorts of companies in this, and they just want to have meetings. I'm like, all right, you have a two meeting limit. <laughs> Yeah, that was a great meeting. Now let's have another meeting. It's like, all right, that was one. Here comes two. This is the last one. <laughs> wow, this was a superior meeting. Let's go get a beer. Now can we have another meeting? It's like, nope, it was a two meeting limit. Yeah. All right. Got to pass that to somebody else. One more question. Going once, going twice. Over here. There's one over here. Oh, that guy? You're letting the body be last? OK. OK. <laughs> Uh, Gary, is that I, working for the streaming, dude? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, just really asking your opinion. Uh, we know software sucks, and we know cybersecurity is bad. Yeah. Um, what, what is? Are things getting worse, or is the media just doing a better job reporting bad things? Things are getting better. <clears throat> okay. Um, I am a very rare thing indeed. I think, um, although some guys at Duo may be this way too. Uh, I'm optimistic that we are making progress in computer security that we're not going backwards, that we're going forwards, and that in the 20 years I've been working on software security, we've made a huge damn difference. I like that. So I, th you know, but when I talk to my friends who've been doing it at the same time, they're all angry oh, people. So maybe I'm just <coughs> insane, <laughs> but I do think that we have learned what to do, and I do think that we're building better code. And I think that building code is harder than it used to be. Now, we're not always making forward steps. You know, the idea to embrace JavaScript, <laughs> that's just incredibly fucking stupid. But we can't stop it, you know? It's like, really? Wow. Is it interpreted? Seven times. <laughs> wow. Wow. Where's the chip? Is there, like, a computer down there? <laughs> You know, and, and people think it's cool because they can, like, you know, drag some shit over and connect it up and it works. And you're like, oh, dude, you really shouldn't connect everything to everything. Yeah, no, <laughs> not so good. So we don't always make forward progress. But by and large, you know, Java's way better than C was. We're slowly getting rid of C. There should be, like, a test for programmers. And if you pass the test, it's like a driving test. It's not hard to pass, but... Apparently, some people don't pass the driving test. Can you imagine? <laughs> and there's a test for programming in C. And if you fail it, well, you have to program in JavaScript. <laughs> Otherwise, you can program in C and maybe cut your own finger off with a saw. Right? So, um, but, I, but, but really, I am optimistic. The banks are in way better shape than they used to be. Microsoft has a thing called a kernel in their operating system. <laughs> That's not a joke, guys. They really do. That's a, they used to not. <laughs> when I started in 1998, they're like, yeah, it's called an operating system. You just like do whatever you want. <laughs> Anybody can do whatever they want, always? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you guys need a kernel, <laughs> really. And, and now, now look at Microsoft. They actually build code that doesn't suck. It's amazing. <laughs> you know. And then Google is finally figuring out that you don't just look at the world through a slit. They were really good at security when it was just the slit. They're like, OK, just watch the slit. Oh, some things came in. Uh, put it in the radioactive box. And it was just about the slit. And then they're like, no, nah, we're going to put some code out there. Now they're just as bad as every other you know, company. And they've gotten past their slit mentality, which is great. Um, so I do feel like we're moving forward, and I am optimistic, and I also think we know what to do. And if you're confused about what you should be doing in software security, I can help you with that. All right, we're done. Thanks very much.